everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz, and I am very happy to welcome back Joel Wolfson, who will be presenting The Simple Path to Stunning Images. Hey, Joel. Hi, Nicole. Thanks. Yes, and thanks for uh, presenting again for us. Joel conducts photo workshops worldwide from his native Southwest to Italy, France, and other locales. His roster of notable clients include Newsweek, L17, Houghton Mifflin, and corporate clients such as Apple, AT&T, 3M, United Airlines, and Pillsbury. His technical articles on digital imaging have been translated for use in more than 30 countries, and he's best known for his artistic images and all of these unexpected views of everyday places around the globe where he conducts his workshops. With that, I'll go ahead and turn that over, turn the screen over to Jill so he can get started. Well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. It's really great to be back doing another webinar for Topaz. And as Nicole mentioned, we're going to talk about the simple path to stunning images using Topaz plugins. I kind of want to start with a quote by Ansel Adams, a man who had a lot of great quotes, but one of my favorites, I think, applies to what we're going to do today. And that is this, the negative is the equivalent of the composer's score and the print the performance. So of course we still make prints in uh, the post film age here and the modern equivalent of the negative is the raw image. So you've gone to a great location at just the right time of day, you have beautiful light, you picked the perfect lens, you nailed the exposure, and now you want a great performance. So that's what we're going to discuss is the performance end of this. So we assume you've gotten your, your great capture and we want to turn it into um, a great image on the other end. So uh, this is especially true with raw images because even though they contain all the information, they come out of the camera a little bit blah, so you know, raw is blah, and we want to get that pizzazz back, and basically we're trying to, trying to get the wow back in the image. We want, we want people to go wow, instead of just, oh, that's a nice image. Now you'll notice um, that I use Lightroom, that's sort of my hub for my digital life and you'll see me popping into Photoshop whenever I need the use of layers. My little rule of thumb with the plugins is that if I am only going to use one plugin and I'll only use it one time, uh, then I don't need layers and it's a little more efficient to just go directly from Lightroom into the plug-in. However, if I'm going to be using multiple plugins or a plug-in multiple times, then I need layers and I'll use something like Photoshop or Topaz's Photo Effects Lab, both of which are great layering programs. Uh, just a little side note, um, Nicole mentioned it, but um, there'll be a link at the end where you'll be able to get some settings that I'm using for one of the plugins I'll be showing today. Also, if you Watch Pro Insights on the Topaz website. That's on their blog portion, I believe. There, uh, I post articles there, and there are articles there from a lot of other pros, so you can get some nice tips. Also, if you sign up for my email list, you'll be notified when I post articles, do reviews, uh, offer presets, that sort of thing. So what I want to do is get going here, and I'm going to start with this image right here, and. This is a landscape in Tuscany. Uh, this is actually the home base of where I conduct my Tuscany photo workshop. So if you ever take that, this is the view you get from where we stay. And it was really a dramatic scene. If you get there at sunrise, sunrise like I did, uh, there's that mist in the hills. You combine that with the, with the sun and the nice warm light in the morning. It's really quite dramatic. Now, this rendition of the image is, is from the raw file, so it doesn't look quite as dramatic here as it did when I was sitting there. But let me show you where I want to go with it. So this is the way it should look, because this is the feel of it, and this is what we want to convey to the viewer. We want the feel of being there. So that's really what I'm going to do today, is try to show you some of the tools to get that little extra wow out of your image, to get the performance, so to speak. And what I'm going to use for that is primarily clarity and then detail for some sharpening. So what I'm going to do is jump into Photoshop first and there you can either right click on the image, uh, it's a control click if you don't have a two button mouse, 
uh, and you can do it on the image in the middle here or you can simply if you're a menu person go up to the photo menu and go to edit in and then we want to jump into Photoshop I'm not gonna spend a lot of time showing you Lightroom here because um, mainly we're like I say we're just using it as a hub so I'm gonna pop into Photoshop and we do want to edit a copy not the original and here we are in Photoshop now you can set up Photoshop in a lot of different ways uh, just for following along with me my tools are on the left the way I have it configured the um, panels are on the right and you'll notice in the lower right is the layer that says background which is my original image I'm gonna duplicate that uh, make a copy of it that's command J on a Mac control J on a PC um, you can also drag and drop it down to this little dog-eared icon on the bottom and I like to immediately relabel these for the plugin that I'm using and maybe say something a little bit about what I might do with that plugin and in this case uh, we want to create that sense of depth that's that's something that clarity is really really good at um, I, there's also as is not untypical with raw images it's lacking a little bit in saturation so we'll definitely be getting the contrast through the clarity part which it's lacking as a raw image and then I'm gonna um, probably bump up the saturation a little bit so I'm just labeling it so I kinda know what I did sometimes I'll go back and relabel it because when I'm inside the plugin I might realize I can adjust something there that um, I hadn't thought about when I first labeled it so I'm gonna jump into clarity here now um, the first thing I do is go to the lower right hand side I don't know if you saw me do that if you follow my cursor there's a reset button and this is um, there's a reset button in most of the Topaz plugins and I just make it a habit of hitting that every single time I go in to the plugin so that I'm starting at my neutral point because otherwise it just defaults to whatever settings you had on there before I'll just give you a quick rundown of the interface for those that aren't familiar with clarity uh, the interface is pretty similar on most of the Topaz plugins so once you learn one it's pretty easy to go to another one if you decide to buy another one or a new one comes out so on the left are presets which are a combination of settings that Topaz provides for you and you can also create your own so if you come up with a combination that you like you can save off your own presets um, I'll just pick one at random landscape pop here on the left just to show you what it does and that's actually not too far off from where we want to be so sometimes you can hit a preset and you're you're where you want to be or you want to use it as a starting point and vary from there I'm gonna reset it because I'm pretty familiar with this plugin and so I like to handle the controls myself so collections are just sets of presets essentially a collection of presets over on the right we have all of our tools up on top are navigation and magnification controls and you'll see me use those a bit as we go through this so these can the sliders the main part of this is the dynamics and the contrast like I mentioned clarity is a contrast program and prior to clarity uh, when I had to use Photoshop to do these things it was a pretty involved process and I'd have to create some pretty complicated actions that wouldn't necessarily work on every photo to, to break down the contrast into areas that I want and Topaz has just made that super easy and that's really the beauty of plugins um, I, I couldn't even probably begin to understand what's behind it in the programming but for us as end users it's great because we can just adjust these sliders and they're pretty aptly named micro contrast is just areas where there's very minimal changes in contrast where one one area or one pixel relative to another there's very little difference so in this case of this image it would be sort of in these trees and in the mist where there's very little contrast to begin with ben, begin with sorry that's where the micro contrast and low contrast come in so I'm just gonna start adjusting those now if I if I pull the slider all the way to the right you can see it it goes a little over the top and of course if I go to the left it's probably gonna look a little funky uh, because it's too low contrast so you know those extremes are only gonna be probably more for special effects but we're just gonna tweak the contrast up just a little bit now I didn't make a very big change here let's see we'll go up maybe 20 or something like that um, and it's a little subtle but I'll do the before there take a look just in the mist in the trees and this gives you an idea of the micro contrast and then as we move up on these sliders 
they they start affecting areas that have broader ranges of contrast relationship. In other words, the lightness to the darkness gets greater and greater as you go up just like it sounds to medium and high contrast. So I just adjusted the micro and the low and remember we're trying to get a sense of depth here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the magnification down because we kind of want to look at this overall. I'm at 50% now so I have a little magnification in there and then I'm also going to bring up the medium contrast a bit too. So I think we're getting there in terms of the contrast. So let me go back to the original just so you can see the difference here. So there's our before. And there's our after. And we're already getting a nice sense of depth there. So it's more, we're already starting to get that feel of sort of being there. The other thing that I obviously need is a little more saturation because the colors are just too dulled. And the cool thing is here in Clarity is that they also have great saturation controls, actually hue, saturation, and luminance. So it's this section on the right where I just hit the little triangle there to open it. And you see it breaks it down into all the colors. So if you do want individual control of just one, one color in the image, like just the yellows or whatever, you can adjust that individually. I'm not going to go into that right now, and I'm interested in the saturation, and I just want a little bit of overall bump. So that's pretty good. I'm going to bring it up just a little bit more. Sort of 15-ish looks good. Now we already, we're almost all the way there and this has just been a few sliders and a couple of minutes and, and I'm almost there on where I want to be. So there's the before and there's after just a few quick adjustments in the sliders. And I, I use clarity for almost every image as I do um, detail and I use adjust a lot too. So those are the ones that I'll probably concentrate on the most here. So I think we're pretty good there. I'm going to say okay, this is going to pop us back into Photoshop. And I'm just going to, if you go to the lower right where I have my layers, there's everything we just did in Clarity where it's labeled Clarity, Depth, and Saturation. If I click on the eyeball, that turns off the layer so you can see where we started. I'll click it again, and there's where we ended up. And now we have that saturation back. We have a really nice sense of depth. All I really need to do now is to sharpen the image. I'm going to, here, let me just zoom in on this. So if I go to 100% here, you can, see it, it, you can see a lot of detail, but you'll see when I go into the detail plugin, where, which is where I do sharpening, I'll be bringing back some of the detail that's lost in almost every camera when you shoot a picture. So what I want to do first is duplicate this layer right here, because this is going to be our st starting point. I'm going to relabel that detail. I don't want to lose anything I did in Clarity, so that's why I made a duplicate of the layer. And in detail, we're just going to do sharpening, and I'm going to do one more thing in there because just looking at this image, I can see that, you know, I shot this very early in the morning right at sunrise. It's very, very warm, and I think my image here is just a hair on the cool side, so um, I'm going to um, I'm going to change. I'm going to put temp here for color temperature. I'm going to I'm going to warm it up just a little bit, and it just so happens that detail has that control in there, and it's very good at it. Of course, detail, as the name might imply, that's its main function, is to bring up detail. What I'll mention is, if you don't already know this, is that most all digital cameras have what's called an anti-aliasing or low-pass filter in front of the chip, in front of the sensor that creates your image, and it purposely blurs the image. Why would the manufacturers do that? Well, it's a good question. The main reason is that they're trying to eliminate something called morays and also artifacts and things like that that can happen as a result of just the physics of the chip, the fact that the chip is sort of a grid pattern. And I'm not going to get into that, but basically you lose a little sharpness with most cameras. There are a few that don't have them, like Leica, Nikon D810, Nikon D800E. There's a few out there that don't have 
those filters so they come out a lot sharper. But most of them require sharpening. And, and even though I, I have one of those Nikons that allegedly doesn't filter it, I still have to add a little sharpening. So to bring back what we've lost, uh, primarily we're going to be using just the, the small detail um, because that's mainly what's lost in the translation. So I'm going to boost that a bit. And now you can see that there's actually more detail there than it looked like before. So there's my before and there's my after. So we're pretty, we're pretty much done with this. We've gotten our detail back. We have that sense of depth. The only thing I really need to do is just warm up the color temperature of hair. Now, if you go down below where I adjusted the small detail, and you can see they've broken it down to small, medium, and large detail. And then when it, within each one of those, there's a boost. So you can take the small detail that isn't affected and boost the very subtle small detail. And I'll show you a little trick with that later on too. But the temperature slider down here, I do have one of those in Lightroom and I could certainly adjust it in there. But what I've discovered is in Lightroom when I, I'm going to warm this up, I'll show you here. I'll just bring it up just a little bit. Um, and that makes it now, that's just perfect. That's exactly what it looked like with that morning light. The reason I'm using it in detail is I found that in Lightroom when I adjust it warmer, it also increases the exposure a little bit. Whereas I can adjust the color temperature in here. Here I'll show you. I'll make some drastic changes. It doesn't change the exposure at all. It, it just changes the color temperature, which is what I want. So I just find that a little easier if I have to do a small tweak like this. I'm going to say OK. That brings us back into Photoshop. And then when I hit Save, it's going to save it back into Lightroom. And what I'm going to do is pop back into Lightroom here, and then I can show you the before and after. So I'll turn the lights out on the background. And there we are. Pretty huge difference. Uh, all I did was use two plugins, Clarity and Detail. Didn't spend much time in it. And if you take out the time I spent explaining it and talking to you guys, um, this is really a quick way to really put that wow factor back in the photo. And I'll, I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see um, the difference in the, I mean, even when I blow it up like this and you're not standing that, don't have that standing back view where it's smaller, you can still see a, a much greater sense of depth. You feel, you feel like you can really wind around that road and just go right into the scene. And that's really what we're after here. All right. So next image is this. And I'm going to have a little fun with this. So this is a sunrise I shot in the Tetons. And I'm sure many of you can relate to arriving at a beautiful scene like this and feeling like you're standing in some kind of three dimensional painting and the clouds. If you look at those clouds, they look like brush strokes, and the sun hasn't fully crested the horizon, and everything just kind of feels like a painting. At least that's the sense I got there. So that gives me kind of a good lead in here for Topaz's new program called Impression, which sort of allows you to delve into another medium. If you're not familiar with Impression, it is it is brand new. Um, it's a it's a program to allow you to do uh, paintings essentially from your photos. Now that's that's nothing new in and of itself. There are a lot of filters out there. Photoshop has some painting tools built in. But I have to say this is the best I've seen so far and, and by a lot. It's really versatile. You can create something that looks like a pencil drawing or an oil done with a palette knife. And really it's just pure fun. I've been using this since it came out, playing around with it. Um, I created some presets for Topaz and if you have a painter's heart like me, you're just going to love it. And you don't have to be a painter to have fun with this. So I'm going to jump in directly into Impression this time um, because that's the only plugin I'm going to be using. So rather than go through Photoshop, I can go down here under my Edit In menu down to Topaz Impression. And yes, I want to do a copy, and it's going to drop me. It makes a copy on the fly just like the other um, plugins, and it's going to drop me right into the impression plugin. So, what it's doing now is it's loading all the presets. You can see them appearing on the right there. And you'll notice they are on the right. Um, so, this plugin is a little different in terms of interface than the other ones. 
from Topaz. Um, I like the way they laid it out in here, and it's nice to have it have a different look because it does a totally different thing. We're talking about painting and charcoal, and you can see it came up with a charcoal drawing by default, and that's pretty darn good. So over on the right, it's defaulted to the featured presets here, and they're all again, they're all different sets of presets. It's a pull-down menu here. So I'll just run through just a couple really quick so you can see. So if I go down here and I pick colored pencil. Voila, all of a sudden I have actually quite a good rendering that looks looks like it really was done in colored pencil. Um, if you want uh, Monet, you know, there's Monet version. Um, I'll pick Impasto, which is a, a style with a really heavy, uh, thick amount of paint, something like a palette knife painting. You can see you get that, that kind of look. So... Um, what, what I'm going to go after here is because this is a scene where it kind of felt like you were inside a painting, yet you know I'm starting with a photo. I don't, I, I don't want to make it look purely like a painting and only a painting. So I'm going to, what I, my goal here is to try to come up with a painting that approaches realistic. So maybe if you stand back, you might take a second glance and go, oh, is that a photo? and as soon as you get up to it you see it's obviously a painting. So that's kind of the look I'm going for. Um, I'm in the painting presets here and there are tons of great ones and I would love to spend all day on this but I just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of this thing. Um, here I'll just start with this one here. This is one called Monet Impasto and that um, it's one that I made for um, for Topaz and there's some other photographers that have some really great ones that they made for Topaz too that they built right into this program. So you've got some uh, that you can use right off the bat that were done by professional photographers. So this one is called uh, Monet-ish Impasto and, and surely with this image where there's a lot of detail in it, um, on the bottom it looks a little more Monet-ish and on the top it's definitely Impasto with those big broad, almost big broad brush strokes and thick paint or could even be palette knife. And that's not where I want to be. That's, that's not at all um, approaching photorealistic. So I click on the little, little control icon here and voila, there's all my controls. Now I'm not going to go into every single control and I have to say that in typical Topaz faction, uh, fashion, these are very well labeled. So it's pretty obvious what they do. On the top we have different brush types and there's little drawings of them so you can pick the kind of brush type you want. Um, the brush size is uh, fairly obvious if I, if I pick a bigger brush. Uh, we wait a second here, and you can see the brush. Um, the brush is much larger, so we have a lot, a lot bigger blobs and brush strokes and whatnot. And I'll, uh, I'll just kind of put that back where it was. Um, if you want to quickly get back to where your preset was, you can just go to the top and click on that preset, and it'll, it'll zip you right back to where you were when you started with the preset. Um, there's a bunch of other controls here: paint volume. Um, the brush size is obvious. We just did that. The paint volume is, as you bring the paint volume down, now it's starting to look a little more like watercolor, whereas if I bring the volume up, the paint's a lot thicker, so that's pretty self-explanatory. And you can see, you can actually see the physical paint. It's pretty cool, plus you can see the canvas showing through on that. The stroke rotation, um, this is, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this down just a little bit in magnification so that we can get a little more of an overall view so you can see what the brush strokes do in broad areas like the sky and in more detailed areas like the sagebrush. And let me just go back to the original real quick so you can see. this. The reason I picked this image is because there is a lot of detail in it. So if you want to get something that's approaching a photorealistic version of a painting, um, you do want to start with something that's highly detailed. If you're starting with something painterly, it just kind of gets more painterly. And this uh, stroke rotation, it, it does just that. It'll rotate the brush strokes at different angles. So if I, if I move this over, you can watch the angle of the strokes go at more of an angle instead of a horizontal like they were before. And, and it just kind of goes on and on here. Um, the stroke color uh, and rotation variation just just puts more randomness into it. The stroke color variation, I'll show you that in just a second. That's actually kind of useful. And that's a new one that just went in a, uh, 
I think a day or two ago when I got the latest version, which is online from Topaz now. So the secret of getting a little more detail out of this and a little more realism is the stroke width and the stroke length. So if I take this stroke width down quite a bit, you can see already we're starting to see a little more detail. Well, the strokes are a little too long, so I need to bring that down too. And if I bring those down a similar amount, you know, voila, there we are. That's pretty much what I was looking for. So the only other thing I really want to do here is there, were, there was all this subtlety in the color up in the sky. And if you notice, the sky has a lot of brush strokes of, of, of very similar color. If you want to add a little more variation to that, that's what this stroke color variation is for, right in the middle of the sliders here. So I'll, I'll do a real extreme first so you can see. And when I do the real extreme, um, you can see it, it takes any subtle difference in color and really exaggerates it. But, it, but if you use this subtly, it, it really just adds a little more um, realism. I, I don't mean realism in terms of being there realistic, but just it makes it look more like a real painting um, because each brushstroke color is not exactly the same. So um, I kind of like that variation there, and, and this, is, this is really what I was looking for. So I'm going to go back down to the overall so you can see it. I'm going to say OK and pop back into Photoshop. Oh, you know what? I'm going to show you one more thing. I just I just realized, so we have some more um, palettes down here, and I'm, I'm sure some people are wondering about this. Um, I'm not going to use it a lot in this one, but this color thing is really useful, and this is very much like, like the one in Clarity, where it just breaks down hue, saturation, and and lightness to all the different colors. So if you want to pick a color, like if I hover over it, you can see it gives me this these striations to show me where that color is in the image. If I go on the yellow, you can see it's in the trees and the sagebrush. If I go over here to the blues, um, I can click on that. Now you see it's highlighted. Now I can adjust just the blues in the image. So I might want to change. If I, if I go to the right, it's going to be a little more purple. If I go to the left, it's going to be a little more cyan. And I kind of like it a little more cyan. I can take the lightness down. I can... I can make that color really dark, I can make that color really bright, um, but I might want to bring it down just a little bit just to change it slightly. Um, the other one that's, uh, I'm not going to get into the lighting and every little nuance here, but the other one is the texture. Um, that's kind of useful. I'm going to show you now. You saw when I brought down the paint opacity, it looks like the canvas is showing through. If you want more or less of that, that's what this strength is for, and I can bring the strength way up and really see that texture. But um, I just kind of want to show, to make it look like it's showing through where there isn't quite as much paint. Now when I blow this up, another thing you'll see, and this is another cool feature I can show you, uh, there's these little white specks because I remember I brought the brush width and the brush length down quite a bit, so um, naturally there's going to be a few little gaps here and there with no paint, so to speak. So it, what I can do is just fill that in down here under background type. I can go from solid to original and it's going to go back to the original image and fill in those colors and voila I no longer have those little specks in there but at the same time I still was able to get all this detail I still have the texture of the canvas showing through and everything that I wanted so I think we're pretty much there I'm going to say OK brings me right back into Lightroom I guess I said Photoshop before I'd forgotten we started in Lightroom we only used one um, we only used one plugin, so that's all we really needed to do. So here's where we started, and here's where we ended up. And let me just do a comparison on those so you can see. And you can see when it, at, at the full view like this in a smaller magnification. Um, it is, it is almost like you're standing back, and if you look at the mountains and the, ca and the little cabin and the sagebrush, it's, there is a, a little bit of a sense of realism there, which is what I was going after, yet if you look up in the sky, there's clearly brushstrokes, and that's exactly what I was looking for. If I zoom in, you, know, you can see the detail versus the brushstrokes. So th this thing is just a lot of fun, and I, I highly encourage you to try it, and if you really, it, it's really way beyond what any of the other painting filters and programs out there that I've seen in terms of taking photos and converting them uh, into a painting.
So I want to do, uh, I think I have time, I can do another image here to show you um, how to get that wow factor in your photos. I'm going to start with this photo right here. So <clears throat> this is up at the Grand Canyon. This is a, a, a large Kiva style structure and a lot of people miss it when they go there and, and those that do go in don't always look up which is really the coolest part of this thing. It's this multi-tiered, really has a sense of depth to it just looking at it. So this is a good one to show again how to use something like clarity to, to get that wow factor and that depth back into the image. So not that it isn't a cool image uh, the way it is derived from the raw file but we want to go beyond that and really try to get that that wow factor. So I really want to try to translate that sense of depth and awe of the multiple levels and we also want to accentuate the artwork. There's all this beautiful native intricate artwork in there. So we're going to make use of detail too. And the other thing you might notice about this is there's a lot of variance in exposure here. There's bright sun coming through the windows. This is a somewhat uh, dim interior so there's areas um, especially like over here on the left and up on the ceiling that are very dark and it's hard to see the detail. So another plugin that I that's really really good at this is Adjust. And Adjust is one is definitely my go-to for equalizing exposure. It's it's my go-to for some other things too. If um, I wouldn't want to have to make this choice, but if somebody said Joel, you have to choose one plugin out of the 15 that you have from Topaz. Um, I would I would probably have to go with adjust just because it it does so many different things, but in this case, and for sort of bread and butter use, it's it's so good at equalizing exposure that we're going to be using that along with clarity to help add some depth and then detail to to bring out all that intricate artwork. So I'm going to pop into Photoshop here. So I go to Edit in Edit in Photoshop, and I always want to work on a copy. And so the first thing I'm going to do is duplicate my layer because I don't want to work on my original. I'm going to relabel this one. Whoops. If adjust. And then we are, I usually like to say what I'm doing with it too. So um, I'm going to label that. We're going to equalize exposure. And we'll probably, again, like we did with the other one, um, bump up the saturation. Um, you'll see how it, I'm going to use the saturation a little differently here than I did in, in uh, Clarity. So I'm going to go under Filter, Topaz Labs, go into, what are we going into? Adjust. So there it pops us into Adjust. I hit Reset just in case uh, there were any previous settings on there. Now it's the same layout as the other plugins. We've got the collections and presets on the left. We've got our adjustment tools on the right. And the real power of this plugin is the adaptive exposure. And it truly is adaptive exposure. So I'm going to click on that. And what does that mean? Well, your typical exposure slider just increases the exposure or decreases it. So if you if you move a regular exposure slider over to the right or to increase exposure, you'll bring up your shadows and you'll burn out your highlights. Um, this one is truly adaptive and you can bring up shadows without losing highlights and maintain highlight detail. It's great. So whichever um, direction you need to go, it's really good at equalizing exposure. The other key to this is the regions. If you think of the regions as like uh, overlaying a piece of graph paper on your image and then you can vary the number of squares there, that's how it's just dividing it up like that. So the reason that's important, especially in an image like this or even more so in a night image, is there's all these different pockets of exposure in the same image from, from really bright to really dim and in between and they're all over the image. So that's where this thing is going to shine. So that's my rule of thumb. The more variation I have within an image with exposure, the higher the number of regions. So if I put this on one and I bring adaptive exposure up, it's going to do the best it can to try to equalize that exposure. And it's not bad even with one region, but where it really shines is if I bring up the number of regions 
going to go up to 30 here, and then I start to bring up this adaptive exposure. So right around the 30-ish range looks pretty good. So already I've made a huge improvement in terms of equalizing this exposure. So there's my before. You can see, especially over on the left here, there's all this dark area over down on the floor here. It's really dark. And it brings up all those images, but it, but it still hasn't blown my bright areas like up in the ceiling here and where the lights are. You know, you can still see texture where that stuff is lit up. And that's, you know, pretty much what I want to do with this. So let me, um, I'll increase the magnification a little bit here. So I'll just do another, there's, there's the before, you know, take a look at these dark areas and the brighter areas. So you can see I brought up those shadows without sacrificing my highlights. Now, when I go down to the color menu down here, you notice that the saturation, there is an overall saturation control in the middle here, but up at the top is adaptive saturation, and it, it does a similar thing. I'm going to, because I, I have big differences in saturation too, I'm going to bring up the region similar to where I have it for the adaptive exposure, and then I'm going to bring up my adaptive saturation. And it's doing a similar thing, but with saturation. So it's going through the image, and it's not just doing an overall saturation boost. It's, it's doing it adaptively. So um, we're pretty close to where I want to be with this because our objective here was to equalize the exposure, and I think we've done that. I'll go back to um, an overall view here. So there's our before, and there's our after. And, and we're most of the way there with this image. I still want to add some more depth because there's, you know, looking up at this thing three stories, three levels, there really is a lot of depth, and although I have a pretty decent sense just from using adjust to equalize exposure, um, I want to get in there and mess with the contrast so that I can bring that up to and, and add more of a sense of depth to it. So there's, there's everything we just did in this layer. Again, we're going to duplicate the layer. Whoops, I just created a new layer and didn't want to do that. I want to duplicate the layer. So I can drag it down to the little layer icon. I'm going to relabel it because this time we're going to go into clarity. And again, I'm going to label it depth, but I'm also going to um, do some selective saturation here because although we equalize exposure, there's, there's a couple little um, tweaks I want to do with the saturation and because we have that selective saturation and clarity that's a good place to do it right along with adding our sense of depth. So I'm going to go into clarity. That's something I really love about these plugins is although they, they have an overriding specific purpose, Topaz includes enough other controls in there that you can often do a, a lot of what you need to do the lion's share in just one plugin. Um, and certainly if you're just using a couple plugins, you can cover most of the bases. So uh, we are here in Clarity, and so I'm just going to go through these controls again like we did with the other image. I'll bump up the magnification just a little bit. Um, you don't, when you're doing this uh, for a sense of depth, uh, you know, which is, which is w one of the areas that Clarity really shines, you don't want to magnify in too much because you want to be able to have kind of an overall sense. So I'm going to the portion here where we can see everything from the floor up to the third level and the ceiling. Uh, yet it's magnified a little bit so you'll get an idea what it's doing. Um, I'm just, so I just start with the slide. I always start with the micro contrast um, and, and just start bringing this up until I, until I get that, that real sense of depth that I want. And, and that's pretty good right there. Now, I'm going to bring up the medium just a little bit, too. And again, remember, these are aptly named. So the, so the low contrast slider is working on areas where there's very little difference in contrast to start. The medium is where there's, there's a, you know, say, a noticeable difference in high contrast is where there's big differences between light and dark. Now, that's distinguished from the tone level below where you're dealing with rather than a relationship, you're dealing with a specific 
area. So we're just in, down here, and I'm going to adjust that in a second because it needs it. The black level, the midtones, and the white, and that's all it's doing. Whereas up here, you're dealing with the relationship between light and dark with these sliders. So that that's one of the things that helped me kind of wrap my head around this. Um, the high con contrast, I hardly ever go up with it. I'm going to go down with it because what's happened is we've we've brought up the contrast on all these other ones and what happens is the darks go darker and the lights go lighter and so when we get to the high contrast areas a lot of times there's too much disparity and we want to bring that down so this is a pretty typical way I use this where I bring the first two or three sliders up and the high contrast I bring down now I still have some dark areas I want to bring up so that's where the black level is going to come in it's just going to affect the black level now, if you want, you can go up to the top here, upper right, click on histogram to make sure you don't get rid of all your darks. And if you really want to tweak it, if I start, whoops, I, I want to go the other way. Sorry, I want to bring my black levels up because they're too dark. So you can see visually they're coming up, and you can also see that the histogram is bringing those up. And if I go much past the 30 mark, um, I can see that I'm going to lose my black black. So if you're not, for those of you that like to use histograms, you can use that as a guide or you can just look at the image if you have a well calibrated monitor. Uh, Midtones is, is going to be like sort of an overall old fashioned exposure slider. I might bring that up just a titch. And the white level, um, I am going to bring that down a little because bringing down my high contrast didn't bring down the white level quite where I wanted it. So I think that's just about perfect. Um, let's go to our overall view here. And there's where we started where just was pretty good. And now look at all that extra depth we brought in. So all we have left to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop back into Photoshop here by saying, OK, um, that should process my image and bring me back into Photoshop. And there's the layer we just did. And I, I, we have all this intricate artwork in there that I really want to make sure it gets accentuated even if someone were to walk up to a large print and scrutinize it. So I'm going to create yet another layer, and this is going to be detail. And I'm going to go into the detail plugin and just do a little sharpening. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but, but some of you who have watched my other webinars know that when I've discussed doing a sharpening workflow that I usually advocate the first step being the capture sharpening. So in other words, when we were talking before about bringing back the sharpening that was lost in the capture, which is lost with most, most cameras and even, even to some extent the cameras that don't have that low pass or anti-aliasing filter we would normally do the sharpening as a first step. However, sharpening is works on contrast as does clarity. So when we're using clarity to add depth, what I've found, and I, and I could probably argue it either way, but what I've found is that if I use clarity first, I usually don't have to do quite as much sharpening. And sometimes sharpening can add a little noise in areas you don't want, and clarity does not add noise. So I've sort of gone to the philosophy that if I'm going to use clarity in a file, and I use it for an awful lot of my images, almost all of them, uh, it just allows me to do a little less sharpening. So it, that sort of becomes a second step. But like I say, I could argue it both ways. You ask two photographers, you get three opinions. So just bear that in mind. And I just wanted to explain to you if someone was paying attention why I was doing the sharpening now instead of uh, before clarity. So I'm going to magnify this because now we are interested in intricate detail and I want to bring that back. Now if you look at it you're going to say okay that looks pretty detailed but you'll see when I when I bump this up and that's really good. Now you may have noticed and I, meant, I, I promised before I was going to show you this little trick. You may have noticed that by bringing up the small detail, I also brought up some noise. So if I want to maintain some small detail and try to get rid of some of that noise, I can go to a negative boost. So this is a nice little trick in detail. So I've gotten rid of some of that noise. 
if I do the before, there's my before, and there's my after. I've gotten quite a bit of extra fine detail in there and brought back that sharpening without sacrificing much in the way of noise. And certainly on a print you would never see that. So there we are with our final image. And if you look over on the right, now this one I have three layers because I did three plugins. If I undo all of those, you can go back to the original image. So I'll go through step by step so you can see. So the first one is adjust. And that we did mainly to equalize exposure. We did a little bit of saturation. And then we did clarity to get that sense of depth. And finally, we did detail, which at this magnification, you're not going to see much. But if I bring that up, turn off the detail, and then turn it back on, then you can see the difference. So I'll save this back into Lightroom. And I'll compare it side by side with the other one. And voila, there we are. Pretty dramatic difference. And so there you are. That's the simple path to stunning images and having people say, wow, instead of just nice image. Awesome. All right. Thank I you think, so um, much, Joel. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. And I hope that Joel showed you the simple path to stunning images. I think from all the feedback, he definitely did. So I'm glad everybody enjoyed themselves. Thanks again. Thank you Joel. again, everyone. Yes. And thank you, Darcy, for answering all the questions that came through today. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks.